My name is Katie Paris. I'm the founder of Red, White, and Blue. If this is your very first event or your hundredth event, we are so, so happy that you are here. When we come together, it reminds us that we are never, ever alone. And the community that we are together is our power. We are here together and it's going to be an amazing night because Angie Thomas is here, author of The Amazing to Hate You Give and so many other books that are so important to our kids and to this country. And, you know, on top of being a best-selling author, of course, she's also one of the most banned authors in the country, which you all know so much about because you're working in your communities against all of this. And it, the, the timeliness of this is so critical of what we're doing here tonight. And Angie and her commitment to be with us here tonight, the timing matters so much because we are just 19 days away from the 2023 elections. And that means that there are tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of school board races happening in just 19 days. And in many of these races, we know that there are people who want to ban books, get rid of any lessons having to have having to do anything with racism or LGBTQ plus kids, any of that. We know that there are people on the ballot trying to get on our school boards, trying to take our kids back to 1950 when we really need to be preparing them for 2050, right? So Angie understands that in a deeply personal way. And so we're going to be talking with her about her whole amazing journey and her whole story. And we are going to be bringing on some students who have fought to keep her book on the shelves. We're going to be talking to some of your fellow troublemakers from across the country who are working in their communities to make sure that we elect candidates who want to keep these books on the shelves and make sure that we're preparing our kids for the real world for the future too. Um, and of course, it will never be a red wine and blue event if we were not giving you all specific action steps to make a difference in these local elections. It's all about local, you guys, you know that. So we are going to be bringing on the Julies from the red wine and blue team, Julie Collins of Julie Womack, to do one of our troublemaker trainings about how to use our tool Rally. You can use, if you've got a phone, you can just like put your uh, camera up and get that QR code, go directly to the site to um, make a login. It takes like 20 seconds to make a login on Rally. And it's so easy to use, it's so intuitive, but they're gonna walk you through it. And this is the most powerful way that you can influence local elections. And also if you don't know about QR codes and want, don't wanna do that, you can put um, it 59868, like you're dialing that out of somebody's phone number and put rally in the message and you will automatically get a message back that has the same link. So don't walk away from here tonight with any regrets. Feel inspired and feel like you have, you know, concrete things that you can do to make a difference where you are. That's where our power comes from. Okay, so let's get to it. You all are not here to see my face. You are here to see Angie Thomas. So I want to bring her on. Angie Thomas, just an incredible author of, um, of The Hate You Give, but also on The Come Up and Concrete Rose and um, best-selling, New York Times best-selling author. Her books have been made into movies. Um, first, welcome, Angie. We On our team at Red, Wine & Blue, we have been looking forward to this all week. Thank you for oh. being here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay. I have got to ask you just about this journey. When I think about the women of Red Wine and Blue, the stories we hear every day are about women who maybe they had never gotten involved in anything, like using their voice in a public way, speaking up at it, whether it's speaking up at a school board meeting or, you know, at a local hearing of some kind or organizing their community. And it's this journey of finding their voice. And it's not always a straight line, right? And it made me think of you because I love it when I have heard you share your story. And I'm not sure everyone knows that like you wrote The Hate You Give while you were working as a church secretary, I believe in Mississippi, <laughs> right? Yeah. And like, I just like, can you just share this amazing story of like going from that to this? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I the funny thing is, I first wrote when I was in college. Um, I attended a mostly white upper class private Christian school in conservative Mississippi, and I was the only black student in my creative writing program. 
Um, in fact, I was the first Black student to graduate from my creative writing program. And so I often found myself being two very different people in two very different worlds. My dog just had to come see hi. Um, <laughs> but being there and and hearing two hearing different conversations regarding race and racism and specifically police brutality um, after the death of a young man named, um, oh my gosh, Oscar Grant in Oakland, California. Um, and hearing my classmates at my school say one thing and people in my neighborhood say another, it gave me two different ears, so to speak. Well, we have two, but it also, it affected me greatly and it pulled something out of me. And while I was in college, I wrote a short story and it was about a boy named Khalil, who was a lot like Oscar Grant, a young man who made mistakes, loses his life at the hands of police brutality and his mistakes are held against him in his death. And then there's a young lady named Star in the story who's a lot like Angie at that time, going to a school totally different from where she lives, being two different people in two different worlds. And that short story is what would later become The Hate You Give. Happy to say I got an A for it. Um, and so, but this was in like 2011, but it took me several years to decide to write that book, to decide to write that story. And it took the deaths of Trayvon Martin. It took the death of Michael Brown. It took the death of Sandra Bland. It took the death of 12 year old Tamir Rice to emotionally put me in a place where I said, you know what, I don't know what to do. I just know how to write. And so I was working at a church. And yes, I wrote some of those words in a church. I've asked for forgiveness. I, God, me and God were on good terms. But um, <laughs> I wrote it while I was there. And it actually, I got my literary agent through Twitter. I still call it Twitter. I don't know who X is, you know. But um, I got my literary agent through Twitter because when I was writing it, we were still in the early phases of saying we need diverse books in children's publishing. You know, a study had just come out saying that there were more books featuring animals and trucks as the main characters as, than black kids. And I'm thinking there's no way this book about a 16 year old black girl who witnesses her friend killed by a cop is going to get an agent or going to get published. And so I got on Twitter while I'm sitting at my church job and I asked during the agency's Q and A session if a subject matter like this could even be published. An agent responded, he loved it, signed me as a client, and The Hate You Give ended up in a 13 publishing house auction. And so from there, my life completely changed. So I, I use that story to tell people, long story short, I use that to often tell people the thing you're afraid to do is probably the thing you're meant to do. If you're afraid to speak up, if you're afraid to speak out, if you're afraid to change something in your community, that fear is there, but you have to overcome that because that's probably the thing you're meant to do. That's probably the thing you're supposed to do. That's beautiful. I'm writing that down. Um, <laughs> it, it actually makes me think about sort of this paradox of the fact that your books are are best selling, uh, or being you know on the come up is being made into a movie too. The Hate You Give, obviously, a blockbuster movie. On the other hand. You have people who are doing just the opposite, trying to tear it off the very shelves on which they, they sit. And I, you know, I just wonder if there's something, is it almost happening for the same reason? There's something so powerful about this book. And so, so some people are lifting that up and other people, is there fear behind it? Why? I mean, what do you think the goal is of these book bands? You know, the interesting thing to me about the book bands is the message, well, let's just say this. People ban my books because essentially they scare them. My books scare them. But the thing is, the reason my books scare them is because of they're judging it by its subject matter, not its cover, but its subject matter. And most of the time, the people who are challenging the books never read the book. Now, here's the thing look about it that's interesting to me. They look at it and they see these subject matters oh, and they hear about words being used that, you know, maybe aren't clean words. There's language, there's violence in the book. It talks about police brutality, blah, blah, blah. They're seeing these things at face value. What's interesting to me is that's the same thing that they often do to the kids who see themselves in those books. The real stars, the real Khalils of the world. These are the kids who, when you sometimes when people see them, they make judgments before they ever open their mouths. And for me, as a Black woman, this is something I've experienced my entire life in this country. And as now a Black woman who looks at these kids and writes for these kids, 
it angers me knowing that the same assumptions that are made about them are made about books written for them. And so the interesting, the funny thing is I have all these young people who love to hate you give. I've had young people who said, you know, it inspired me to become an activist and they're speaking up and speaking out and that they're finding their voice, they're finding their power. They're going home and they're challenging their parents on things that maybe they didn't want to discuss with them. You know, I had a young 17 year old white boy who came to me and said, you know what? I had a, a discussion with my parents about privilege and it made them uncomfortable. And I'm like, oh, wow. OK, you know, they're they're upset that we're opening these kids eyes to lives unlike their own at times. And but what I'm upset is what you're saying is, too, is, OK, so the kids who see themselves in these books need to be quiet. They need to disappear. They need to be silent. And so it's, it is this paradox of on one hand, you know, there's all this success because the book has made people uncomfortable. On the other hand, the challenges are happening because the book makes people uncomfortable. I think that's right. That is why, it is, <laughs> why it is so powerful. And, you know, to me, it's like when I, when I think about, about that white parent who's so concerned about that, it just, all I can think of is how much they're just holding their kid back. Like, this is just. This this is the world that right. we do. You want your kids to 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 navigate it, or right. you know, go hide under the covers and not succeed with it. Right. Well, you know? one of my favorite phrases um, comes from an educator by the name of Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, and she says that books are mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. Now, what they're trying to do is board up the windows, destroy the mirrors, and put walls up in front of those sliding glass doors. Now, if we allow that to continue, we end up with leaders, young people who become leaders, young people who become Congress people, mayors, governors, teachers, educators. We end up with young people who do not know what it's like to be someone who isn't them. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say I'm sick of politicians who don't care about someone unlike themselves. I'm sick of politicians who don't see things or leaders who don't see things from the perspective of someone who doesn't look like them, who isn't of the same religious beliefs as them. I'm sick of that. But what these books do is they give these kids a mirror or a window or a sliding glass door to put themselves in someone else's life and gain empathy. And empathy yep. is far greater than sympathy. And I think it's one of our most powerful tools. And what they're doing right now is they are threatening empathy in this country. I agree. And what, what could possibly, you know, I mean, it's just amazing that that's controversial, right? Isn't that yes. what we want? We should want most of our kids. Okay. You spoke about politicians, about our leaders, and that is very relevant, right? We have an election in 19 days. There are all these school board races going on. And a lot of people who do want to ban these books are trying to take over school boards. <laughs> Now, one of the things to me that is most powerful about how you write is that you make the political personal. What advice do you have for us as we work to get out the vote for candidates who think that books should be read and not banned? You are a, a, an advocate, an artist, an activist through your writing. And you do it in this way that, and I think that's what that that's what makes people successful. Oh, okay. did Influence. No, I'm not going to. Hey, uh, we, that's, a, oh, that's a red wine and blue bed. We got a kid saying hi. Um, hi. But, hi. Um, but th that is what makes, um, how do we make the political personal in these, you know, because that's what they're doing. They're injecting all this politics mm -hmm. into our schools. And how do we, how do we fight that in a way that doesn't, you know, we, we don't politicize it ourselves, right? You know, it's mm -hmm. like, we got to keep this personal. What's your mm -hmm. advice on that? Well, I say we have to make the political personal or the political will make us its personal target. <laughs> we've seen this as women. We've seen this, you know, um, but it, it really boils down to the fact that when we're talking about politics and we're talking about making things personal and, and we're talking about addressing these things, um, is the unfortunate fact is that for so many of us in this country, politics target our personal, our identity so often. And there are so many of us marginalized folks who have no choice but to make the political personal because it's often coming at us in the way we just navigate this world, the way we exist. 
you know, as a black woman, you know, I, I know that there are certain policies, they're just now making it so that I can wear my hair natural without being targeted in certain um, workspaces, you know? So, so often for so many of us, the political is already personal, but what we have to start thinking about is, re or recognizing is our power in the political. Um, you know, we have to remember that these people who are in these offices, they ultimately serve us. The school board serves the community. They cannot come in there with their own personal agenda. This has to be something they have to represent the community. And they cannot not only represent one or two loud mouths, they have to represent the community as a whole. And that means you have to make this about you. You have to recognize that, you know what, this policy right now, mm, I don't think it affects me, but the next one will. Oh, this this here what doesn't affect me, the next one will. Um, and, and we have to make ourselves heard in these things because as long as you're silent, you're ignored. Silence mm -hmm. is ignored. So I, I, I think too, again, for me, speaking as a black woman, I'm like, how can you not make politics personal? You know, one of my favorite stories is about Rosa Parks and how, you know, and it feels so cliche, but one of the things a lot of people don't know is when Rosa Parks was on that bus, um, she said at one point that the reason she didn't give up her seat was because she thought of Emmett Lewis Till, that 14 year old black boy who visited Mississippi from Chicago and was murdered. She did not know Emmett, but she took his death personally. And in her taking his death so personally, she changed our country as we know it. So that right there is a prime example that it matters. It, it, it makes a difference to take it personally. It, it, it makes a difference to get emotional. You know, so often, especially for us as women, we're told, don't be emotional, walk in there, you know, be strong, blah, blah, blah. No, there's power in my emotion. If I'm angry enough to cry, there's power in that. If I'm angry enough to yell, there's power in that. If this hurts me and affects me, there's power in that. And I'm going to use that power to make myself hurt. So yeah, we make the political personal because we have to recognize that it's going to personally affect us. That is beautiful. Thank you. I, okay. We, we have to bring, I could talk to you for 4 million hours <laughs> and I'm glad we're going to keep up this conversation, but right now I want to bring some really in, important additional people into it. So we have, we have students here who are um, from Lincoln university and they successfully fought a ban of the hate you give. So we just thought when one of our organizers connected with them, we were like, we, they've got to come on and meet Angie Thomas and like, <laughs> figure this story. So we're so excited to bring on a, uh, Mackenzie Hanks, Jason Davis, Asia Taugman, and Drake Smith. Um, Lincoln University is an HBCU in Oxford, Pennsylvania. And I would love for y'all to come on. Welcome, welcome y'all. So glad you're here. So Jason, uh, if you can hear me, I'd love to start with you to hear about how you fought this ban for local students in the community where you attend college. I mean, what how, how did you get involved? With that? How did oh uh, so, so it it started it really started in the summer. Uh, I had uh, I had the opportunity along with Drake to uh, go to Florida and uh, protest banned books and actually give banned books out. Um, it was a great opportunity. We went to around fifteen cities in five days on a on a bus with John Lewis's face on it. So it was pretty cool to see you know people's uh, reactions to that. And then um you know when we get back you know home you know home at Lincoln. And we get a we get a call from Mackenzie, and and she's saying, well, they're banning books, you know, down the street. And you're like, whoa, we just flew to Florida to you know protest ban books. You you darn too, and we gonna be right there and give us five minutes. And, and that's you know that's really how it started. And um and going you know to that school board meeting, um it was different because we went to a school board meeting in Miami Dade County, and uh and parents were all against the book banning. So so to see people for book bannings, especially with this type of, uh, you know, literature is kind of is, is nuts <laughs> in, in a sense to say, um, to keep it real, it, it is nuts. But um, yeah, we had uh, we had the opportunity to go there from Mackenzie and um, basically just talk on behalf of, you know, the kids who the, who these books affect and who these books, you know, are for, you know, they're not for the, you know, the parents who think that it's this or is that it's for the, you know, the children and the people who go through these sim similar situations that can, you know, really be affected by these. Again, I, I said this, you know, yesterday, if it's not for you, you don't need to be reading it. 
Can it be for me? I I love this book too. Can, can I be? Can I be for you guys. It's, you gotta you gotta ask Miss Thomas. <laughs> absolutely, you, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Drake. I'd love to hear. So take us take the story forward. Tell us a little bit about how you spoke out and how how this all happened and how you know the hate you give was targeted and how in the end you all won. So absolutely. First of all, it's just an honor to be on the call with uh, uh, Ms. Angie Thomas. Um, I mean, this is like being on a call with uh, Maya Angelou or um, 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 Tony Morrison. Um, so it's just, thank wow. you all for the invite. Yes, I know. But thank you all for the invite. Um, I don't have wine, but I have water. So you can kind of see if it's not blurred out, right? How about that? That's acceptable, yeah. <laughs> Especially on a college campus. Same but, here. Um, I just have water. But um, our, uh, our uh, Mackenzie Hanks, um, she's in transit right now. She's on the call. She, uh, like Jason said, told us all, hey, you know, they're banning books right off the road in Oxford. And she's the youngest Democratic committee person in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I think when she was elected, uh, she, yeah, she's, I think she still is. She's the youngest Democratic person, committee person in the state of Pennsylvania. She told us all, like, come on. This was like the day of. And we were like, yeah, why not? Um, my background is I actually served on my school board in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, um, where I was the only student in the country that could vote on a school board, just like the adult members. So I was a bona fide school board member. So I know the decisions that it takes and what it goes into making these types of decisions on the school board. And I said, let me go and just give them my two cents. And I started my speech off by saying, friends, family, and neighbors. And I said, you're not mad at these books. You know, They said they're mad at sexual content in these books, but the hate you give has no such thing. Um, and, and I, I told them, you're not mad at the sexual content, you're that the books, you're mad at the, the sexual content. And, and I'll say a trigger warning. It was about some of these books involved sexual assault. You're mad at sexual assault. What average person is not mad at sexual assault? We'd make sure that these schools are places where students have the ability to read these books and kind of process these very heavy topics, not just with themselves, but their peers, classmates, and teachers. And I said, anyone that thinks that, you know, um, Angie Thomas or Tony Morrison, because they, they ended up banning the bluest eye, are smut writers, shame on you, and actually read the books. Because one of the school board members didn't even read The Hate You Give. Because everybody was like, why is it on the list? There's no such thing uh, with the whole sexual content. And, and I closed where I started. And I said, if only we all viewed ourselves as friends, family, and neighbors. I never understood when I was serving on the school board and you know, we all see the crazy clips on YouTube and going to the Oxford area school board meeting. Why, why is it so volatile? Why it's always me versus you and we're yelling, 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 yelling. Why can't we all just come together and be in a collaborative, collaborative effort? Remember that we're all friends, family and neighbors. Um, and shout out to some of the folks in the chat uh, that were saying that uh, Lincoln University, for those of you that don't know, uh, Lincoln University is the nation's first degree granting HBC, some of our alumni, including Thurgood Marshall, Langston Hughes, and the Honorable uh, Dr. Horace Mann. I just had to throw that in there. Uh, so, but no, it's just great to be on the call. And uh, that's kind of, that's how it did. And, and I think it was thanks to us four students that spoke up, the hate you give didn't get banned. Thank you. It's such an incredible story. I want to get Asia in here. Um, Asia, you know, I know how much you have said that um, this book has meant to you um you know why what it, what was so important to you about this book and why is it so important to you that others also have access to books like that um so hi my name is Asa Tillman I'm a junior political science major at Lincoln um so why it was important to me so when I went to high school I went to a PWI so I was one of three African-American well three African-Americans two African-American girls that graduated in my entire senior class so when I was picking a major, my I was like, oh, I'm just probably gonna go to like, like do nursing or something because that's how like we're programmed as African American women to think like, oh, I need to go help someone, and not um. And my teacher's like, no, like no, you don't need. You can help someone else in a different way. I want you to read this book, and it was the hate you give. Um, I was in an AP English class, and she's like, we were all reading like different books, but she's like, no, I want you to do the hate you give. Like I'm telling you, you're doing the hate you give, and um. Just opening up the book, I was like, okay, you know, it's just going to be a normal little book. I didn't think too much of it. Again, I'm like 16, 17, didn't think too much. I had seen the movie come out, again, didn't think too much about it because at the time I was so programmed to be like, nope, just get done school, get done school. But 
after reading it, Star just like symbolized strength and resilience to me. Um, right before I graduated, I had George Floyd. So once like that came around, I was like, okay, I need to get into my community. So I reread the book and then it just, seeing how Aunt Miss Thomas just like put in such a complex matter into easy words, p- police brutality, racial profiling, like Black Lives Matter through like a lens that I could relate to when I was like 18, 17 years old, it was like crazy. So the book just meant a lot to me. And I still read, read it to this day, just like going through like all my different classes. Um, but even at the school board meeting, I was like the only person that I could really say touched on this book. Cause I was like, okay, you're not banning my favorite book. They already had banned one of my other favorite books. Um, <laughs> Harry Potter, I was like, you're, you're banning Wizards. Now you're banning my other favorite book. I'm going to be irritated now. <laughs> but um, so when I went in there, I was just like, so I could understand the reasonings for the other books. Yes, the topics are graphic, but they also need to be heard by the students. Um, we live in a day where social media, if they don't see it in the classroom, they're going to see it on social media. Um, so when you think about that, it's like, would you rather teach it in a classroom where they could actually get construct ways to deal with it? Would you rather them get on social media and then it deteriorate their mind to a point where they can't even complex it to whoever they need to talk to? So, yeah. That's why the book meant a lot to me. Thank Asia, you. that's so beautiful. Angie, yeah, feel free to respond. Yeah. No, seriously, thank y'all. Thank y'all so much. And, you know, this for me reinforces why I do what I do, but also I hope to everyone watching, this is why it's important to fight these book bans. Um, because I I I I don't want to speak for y'all, but I can say for me, when I was a kid, a young black person in this country, it was hard for me to find books that showed me me, that showed me what I was dealing with, that showed me my experiences. And when you don't see yourself in art, it makes you feel as if you're not valid. And if you look at the books that are being targeted, they're books by black people, they're books by LGBTQIA plus people, um, they're books by Latinx people, they're, they're books by Asian people, they're books by the marginalized of this country. And what's essentially being said is we don't want to know about the discomforts that marginalized people in this country experience. And that's where we should all have an issue. And we should all want our young people to have these books, to have these discussions. Because like I said earlier, I'm tired of having political leaders who don't care about anyone beyond themselves or beyond people who look, think, believe like them. And this is what I mean, just think about it for a second. You know, I'm not going to say a name, but I think about this one former president and I'm like, hmm, if X, you know, 16, 17, he read books by Toni Morrison. He read books by Maya Angelou. If he read books by Black authors, if he read books by LGBTQ plus authors, if he read books by Native American authors, Latinx authors, what kind of person would he have been instead of the one we ended up with? it's worth thinking about. So y'all give me hope. Just <laughs> FYI, we got some good leaders in our, uh, coming up soon. So me thank too. Y'all Plus so everyone much. in this chat. I don't know if you all can see it where you are, but Drake, Jason, Asia, thank you so much. I mean, you're getting like so much praise and love in the chat. You know, thank you for, for leading for, you have like so much wisdom. Like it's just so, this has to be an intergenerational movement. And I'm just so glad to have connected with you all through this and look forward to fighting alongside you all. Um, Thank you. Well, we want to thank you all for just uplifting our voice. Um, I don't think none of us could have expected that we'd be on a call with, you know, 300 plus people and the author of one of these books. Um, And I just hope that one day, uh, you know, we're talking about, we need new political leaders and a lot of people are looking towards us young people but I could see uh, Ms. Angie, you running for office somewhere, mayor, governor, senator, yes. whatever, uh, school board, school board, maybe. Um, and and right. then I would just be um, so remiss if I didn't uh, uplift some of the people that invited us to the Oxford uh, area school board meeting. One of them is in the chat, uh, Tanil DeWeese. She's actually running for school board. Um, hopefully this link works, but that's just, you know, the links to all the candidates. Uh, I put it in the chat, check it out. Um, you know, I know this is you know nonpartisan and stuff, but you know these, these fights they require all of us all across the country to really get involved. And you know we have five st- spectacular people running for the school board because, to quote Dr. King, they're trying to turn school boards in these countries to councils of despair. 
where students aren't learning compassion. I mean, is it crazy that people are against equity and inclusion? That's insane to me. That's, ins that's just them. That's a new term of them saying we're against segregation and busing like they were back in the day. And, and, and I'll close, I guess, with this. This is from Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, Austin Davis. He said the people closest to the power should be closest to the pain. We need to stop having people looking down on us. We need people looking up from our communities to really lead and serve us. And, and they teach us that at Lincoln University. Our motto is learn, liberate, and lead. And, and we're doing that on the local level. And, and this is just showing us that we went from a local level issue to now a national issue where people from all across the country. I mean, we got people on this call where it's still daylight, right? But, you know, it's pitch black. We're at right here on the East Coast. So just thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, thank absolutely. You, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank Derek, you. I look forward to voting for you one day. Just FYI. Is that, is that <laughs> an endorsement? Am I endorsing? Oh, yes. You endorsement? got my endorsement. Yes. Yeah. If only I had yes. that for the, uh, there we go. If only I had that for the student government race. <laughs> we'll start there. You, got, you right. guys walk so we can run. So I want to I want to move on to our, our next section of here. I want to tell you guys what's going to be happening next. And actually, Drake laid that up really well. And he said, oh, I know it's not nonpartisan. It's nonpartisan. And so I, I know, but I want to let you all know who to vote for these candidates. Guess what? It is not partisan to lead with your values and be very clear about who is aligning with those values and who's not. And we are not going to hesitate for a single moment here at Red, White, and Blue to give you all the tools that you need to know who is going to be aligned with those very clear values. So Drake, we're with you and red, white, and blue. Part of what we are going to be giving every equipping people in um, some of the key states where there are school board races, including Pennsylvania, is not just in that school district, um, Drake, but also in districts throughout Pennsylvania and other states where we are facing these extremist candidates. We're going to make sure that you know who they are and who the very brave people out there who are stepping up to bring common sense and stake instead of this chaos to their communities, who they are too. And it is important for us to be brave and use our voices like Angie's inspiring us to tonight to get the word out because we got to make this personal, right? Um, all right. So next up, I am going to bring out, so this is what's going to happen next. In the next few minutes, we are going to have the famous Julie's from the red, white, and blue team lead us through a training. If you are not on rally yet, which is the tool that we use to get out the vote. This is the most impactful way possible. You can influence local elections. So stay with me for this next section. The Julies are gonna walk you through exactly how to do it. If you're already on Rally, you can be spending this time to be adding additional contacts, reaching out to people you know, because you got your juices flowing and you're all inspired. Then Julie is gonna lead a conversation with some of our troublemakers from across the country who are also fighting book bans. And then Angie's gonna come back with us and continue the conversation. And somehow we're gonna fit this all into 20 minutes. So Julie's go. Yeah, we're gonna to try to be quick. I'm Julie Womack, I'm head of organizing for Red, Wine and Blue. And I am Julie Collins, I'm national organizer for Red, Wine and Blue. All right, hopefully you guys were inspired because now it's time for you guys to back up all the things the students were doing and it's time for we, us to step up. So go ahead there, Julie. Yeah, so you're hearing a lot about book bans tonight. Now, do you know how we stop book bans and the chaos in our schools? We elect common sense candidates who support our values, like Katie just said. So in fact, to stop extremism, we need to make sure that we elect our candidates from school board to state legislator to judges. And many of these seats are on the ballot in 2023, 19 days. These offices have a huge impact on not only public education, but also reproductive freedom, gun violence prevention, and so much more. You guys, a lot of voters do not even know that these races are going on or who to vote for, and that is why we need you. So like we said, less than three weeks till elections, people are already voting. There is not time to wait. So we need you to commit to being part of this campaign with us, rallying in your squad and helping us reach the voters we need to win. We're going to help you do that. So we are running this program in Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia, Michigan. Michigan, North Carolina, Ohio, Virginia, and I think I'm, I'm Pennsylvania. I'm so sorry, Pennsylvania. Uh, if so, if you live in those states, we need you involved right now. If you have friends in that state, it's time to get involved. So next slide, Drew. 
So we're talking local and state races in 2023. And these types of races are often won by a handful of votes. So exactly what does that mean? It means that every friend or family member that you turn out to the polls could be the difference maker. These types of elections already have lower vote, voter turnout, and people don't even often know that they're happening. And if they do, they often don't know who the candidates are or what they stand for. And so this means they can vote for extreme candidates, or it can lead to people feeling uninformed and not even turning out to vote at all. And this is exactly what the extremists count on. But you can be the one to change that in your community. So let's talk next slide, Drew. Let's talk about our plan. Um, the people that you have the best ability to sway and influence are the people who are in your phone right now. So I want you guys to get your phone out if you're not on it already. It is our friends and family we need to talk to. This is called relational organizing or friend to friend organizing. It sounds fancy, but it's not. It's just the idea that you talking to friends and family is a lot more impactful than a stranger talking to um, them at their door. And they're going to actually talk to you, right? They're going to talk, take your text. They may not open that door for that stranger. And the data also backs this up. So I want to give you guys a little context. Presidential campaigns spend millions of dollars to move the electoral turnout by 1%. It's a big deal at 1%. But I want to show you what our program, all of you who reached out to friends last cycle, did. Next slide, Drew. So voters who were contacted through our relational program saw a 9.6% higher turnout. And if you think that all your like-minded friends are voting, they are not. And this is why we need to contact them. We saw a 13.8% increase amongst our volunteers. And I love this statistic. 28.1% of the people we reached through this program were unaffiliated or Republicans. This means that you are reaching people that candidates and political parties may never contact. You know your friends best, and your information is way better than anything the candidates and political parties can pull from the voter file. Oh. All right, so you guys ready? Next slide, Drew. You guys, you want to get your phones out. It is time to do this. If you have not done it already, you're going to either text uh, rally to 59868 or scan that QR code to be part of this campaign. I promise you it's incredibly effective. So there's two things we're going to do here. We're going to get you into rally and you're going to be able to get information on how to reach out to your friends. And then you're going to let us know who you're reaching because elections are a math game. We need to know who we're reaching. It's just like canvassing for candidates. You have a list, you reach out, you let them know what's going on, but you're going to canvas from your couch with us. Next slide, please. You'll go to our landing page and then click the state you live in or where you have the most friends and let's set up your account. Click join campaign. Sign in if you have an account or sign up to, to create one. Enter your email and it will be sent a magic link. No passwords. Next, Next slide, please. Okay, and then you're just going to set up your profile, what you do all the time online. So you're going to list your name and then it's going to ask you to match yourself to the voter file find yourself, click yes. If you're not there, then click none of us and uh, go check your voter registration. <laughs> next slide. So the next you start adding the people that you're going to contact. So you're going to see build your network, click add contacts. And to get started for tonight, think about your bestie, your spouse, your adult children, and then just click add contact and you can enter them directly. Or if you want some help brainstorming on who to add, click brainstorm. Next slide, please. It's really cool. This thing helps you brainstorm with different categories of people to think through. You make a list from that, and then it just lets you go and add them. Um, when you're adding your friends, you just need to match a their legal name, city, and age range. We do not ask for a phone number. We do not ask for an email. We are not contacting them. You are contacting them. It's relational organizing. We just want to make sure we're matching to the voter file so that we we know we're which voters we are reaching. Just like, like I said, it's canvassing from your couch. Next slide. Now it's time to start reaching out. You'll see either rally or missions. Get started and click a friend's name. You will see information to share, links to send for things like early voting hours, how to get mail in, how to get a mail-in ballot, or info about candidates or issues. We have it all there for you, so you don't have to search for it, and it's ready to go and up to date. Next slide, please. Actually, I think we can end there, Drew. I think that's good. So you guys, hopefully you are in there. Um, we are so excited to have you be part of this campaign and we need everybody involved. So please um, get going on this. We've got less than three weeks. Get your friends doing this as well. We would love to have as many people as possible. 
Um, and I'm going to say thanks to Julie. And I'm really excited to bring up some of our troublemakers who are here with us tonight. You guys, you've been hearing from um, the students who have been fighting these book bans, but uh, we have some women here who have also been fighting book bans in their community. And I want to talk to you not only about how right. book bans, you know, affect our, you know, obviously are affecting our schools, but there's even a, you know, a bigger piece we don't think about sometimes. So I'm going to start with Patty. Hi, Patty and Rabita. And I know, I don't think I see Christine yet, but I'm sure she'll be here in a second. So Patty, you are a teacher in the Central York School District. Um, can you tell us about the Panther Anti-Racist Student Union that you help um, manage? Uh, absolutely. I, I want to thank Red Wine and Blue for having me today. The work you ladies are doing is just absolutely incredible. I'm, I'm speechless. Um, and shout out to my co-conspirator, Ben Hodge. Uh, ben Hodge was actually the founder of the Panther Anti-Racist Union, which we lovingly refer to as Peru. Uh, about three years ago, um, during the summer of racial reckoning, our school board, um, which was a little different than what it was at that time, banned over 300 resources, including a Sesame Street video that talked about racism. Um, and one of the things that really resonated to me from those students is empathy, because the evil side of this fight will like to say that not every human is deserving of my child's empathy. And what they're trying to say is, not everybody is human. What they're trying to say is if they don't look like me, if they don't worship like me, if they don't have my values, they are not human, which makes it easy for them to indoctrinate their children. Because let's get it straight, indoctrination begins at home, not in the classroom, okay? And it makes it easy to do segregation. It makes it easy to bring in slavery, even if it's a civic kind of slavery. Um, it makes it easy to... Um, brutalize people and discriminate against them based on their hair, based on their color or their sexual orientation when we don't have empathy. And this is what they're trying to teach us from or prevent us from teaching to our children. And I just cannot understand it. It's so crazy to me. Um, but in any case, the children as of the 1960s of the Panther Anti-Racist Union, they were the ones who led the charge to put down the first book ban that happened, including the Hate You Give and three other resources. And then we had a school board member who's running this time around who actually challenged one of the books. Her name came out. They were protecting her for her safety. Yeah, okay. Um, in any case, that came out that she's running for school board and she led a challenge that removed three books from the shelves and they used an administrative regulation that was actually used for classroom materials. So once again, the Panther Anti-Racist Union came out to protest and hold rallies and we had that put down and reversed as well, as well as changing the administrative regulation that had to do with library books. So they are two for zero. And all I can say for anyone out there who is trying to fight, get your babies involved, get your babies involved. This is their fight for their future. Be their foundation, but let them be the voice. And Patty, the one thing I liked about your story, your, I mean, your students put all this time and effort into like fighting these book bans. They were successful. And you said they, and I know they changed the policies. They know like parents can opt out. Um, and I think this is interesting. How many parents have opted out after all of this effort? Um, I have to scratch my head because. One. One. <laughs> but there was this turmoil. There was this, all these parents were so horrified. One. One. One parent, and that parent didn't opt out of all books, just some mature books at the high school. One out of 1,800 children at the high school. Seriously? Yep. Thank you so much, Patty, for sharing all of that. And I think you're going to see a theme here of just a lot of effort for, you know, what what is the actually impact at your school? One family opting out after everything they went through. Christine, you in Milford, Ohio, also had a book ban attempt at your school. And I think it was, this is fairly new for you to get involved, right? Yes. Um, in 2021, um, a small group of us had rallied about masks the year prior. Um, we got when there was a book ban attempt. Um, and in similar vein to what everyone's been talking about, lines of text that were taken out of context, um, school board members and parents who did not read the book and were just reacting. Um, so our small but mighty group uh, got together. We showed our support to the English department. Um, we got students involved. Like Patty said, our students came, they spoke up. Um, 
and it was a bit of a complex process. And I would say, you know, emails help. If if you're nervous about speaking, email the board members, you know, it, it can start there. Um, and so I would also suggest that get to know your school policies um, because some of these policies, people are allowed to opt out, <laughs> like you said, um, but they still just want to raise a stink and create this circus um, that we keep seeing happening. So um, eventually the book was kept. Um, so we were successful and we continue to, you know, fight the good fight and promote, you know, board candidates for this election cycle who, you know, are are not going to, you know, put handcuffs on people and, you know, just um, stop the progress that we've been making. So. And I know we're talking about the impact on school districts. And so who you vote for is so important because your school board members can stop or can hinder, um, I mean, can help or hinder with book bans. You also have some extreme members who are basically not funding your schools. Since now I understand you have an emergency levy because of that. Yes. Um, Milford has uh, an operating levy coming up. We have not had an operating levy in 10 years, um, which is a good stretch. We made three to four years of money stretch 10 years. Um, and two of these extreme board members did not vote for continuous levies, which has put us in a position for an emergency levy, which means two years of funding um, and then stops. And then we have to ask the community for money again in another two years. So because of their votes has put us in this awkward predicament and is not great for the community. So, so who, who you, you vote for? Your, yeah, who you elect matters, right? Yes. And I think there's a bigger, a really big cost to this that people are not even aware of. And Ravita, I'd love for you to talk about your organization, what's happening in your community, and then talk about the cost people may not think about with book bans. Thank you. Thank you all for this. And um, I'm here representing One Wheel Co. We are in Williamson County, Tennessee, which is a suburb outside of Nashville. And we have been involved in this fight um, of equity for our students since 2020. But um, the recent book battles in our area have been similar to what you all have experienced in other areas of the country. We had a parent that complained about some books. And uh, after hundreds of hours of man, uh, people looking at the books and a committee to review the uh, materials, the parent was actually satisfied with the decision to keep the book on the shelf. They were okay with it. But we had a few school board members, y'all talked about the school board members, right? that were bent on trying to continue these complaints. And that ultimately led to four parents from a group that ended up suing our district. So that suit came in August, 2023, uh, trying to remove several books in our libraries from obscene materials is what they claim. Um, in other areas of the country, we don't know what our numbers are here as far as the cost, but there's areas in Texas, for instance, they're spending 220 hours and 16 employees at a cost of over $30,000 for one book. So when we think about our public school system and how they're already financially strapped, you know, I think it's a common denominator that our teachers in this country are not getting paid enough. Um, so when we think about the cost that they're removing to put on those types of uh, things, it's just a waste. And so it's very alarming. We have uh, tags on people's cars around here from groups that um, are conservative and say they don't want the government treading on me. Well, you're treading on my rights. Um, she mentioned that one parent was uh, responsible for that book ban. They are trying to remove this from all of us. And that's what's um, extremely frustrating. So we really have to be um, stand up and be silent. The students that spoke earlier tonight, their voices are very impactful when we are at those meetings and um, holding them accountable. So that's something that I definitely encourage you in your own communities is to try to get your students involved and let them be the voice, but they are very expensive. And for a group to claim they're conservative, but to, to sue the district for this is just um, unfortunate. 100%. And that's why I think it's so important um, that we, as, in this election season, know who's running for our school board and making sure our friends all know who's running for school board so we elect the right people because there is a cost. There's things like funding your schools properly, like in Milford, and the cost behind banning these books and how it actually costs you as taxpayers and takes money from your schools. Um, but thank God for students like Patty's and the students who are on here who are standing up and leading these fights. So we appreciate having you all on tonight. Appreciate your time. And I'm going to kick it back over to um, Katie and Angie. 
amazing. Thank you all so much. And I'm loving, yes, the intergenerational movement that we are representing here tonight on this call. Um, yeah, I'd love to bring you back, Angie, to help us close out what has been an amazing night, all inspired by you and your work. Um, here, here's, I, I do have a question for you. I listened to a lot of your interviews and um, there was something that you said and one that I, I listened to actually just last night where you said that you know the end of the book or the story you're writing before you know the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know the end before you know the beginning. And I thought that was so poetic and beautiful. And it made me think, you know, what we're in right now, it almost feels like we're in the middle of a story arc, you know, mm -hmm. like. I know that this is has long historical precedent in terms of these struggles that we face in our schools, but you know we have this latest um, bout of of extremism starting post 2020 with all these book challenges. We I think at first all felt those of us who represent the majority and in the mainstream a little like what is even happening? You know we had to understand it was an orchestrated movement, get ourselves organized. Now we're stepping up using our voices, making sure that, you know, they're not met with silence. I want to know from your perspective as a writer, how do you see this ending? Mm. Well, <laughs> um, I, I, when I think about the book bans and everything, there was recently an article that came out that said that a majority of the book bans in this country um, are the result of the work of 11 people. And all I can think is, wow, well, what could 200 people do? Like the 200 we have on this call. Um, the fact that we're having these discussions gives me hope. My hope though, what I see is the end. And what, what I see, what I pray is the end is I pray for a day where ultimately a book like The Hate You Give is not relevant anymore. Where young people pick that book up and they say, wait a minute, racism? That existed? Wait a minute, police brutality that existed? When they read on the come up, which was written in response to book bans, wait a minute, there was censorship? What? People wanted to ban books? This is wild. When they, you know, pick up, a, when they read articles about 2023, 2022, what? what? People were attacking literature? Teachers were scared to teach. Librarians were scared to do their jobs. What are you talking about? This does not make sense. I long for the day where the things that are happening right now just don't make sense to the young people of the future. And we have the power to make that happen. So I look forward to it. There's nothing more inspiring <laughs> to say than that. I knew I wanted you to ask you that question because you're, you're the writer. I want to breathe into the future that you paint for us. And sometimes you just have to imagine it to believe it and reach for it. Angie Thomas, thank you so much for being here tonight. I think we got to answering most of the questions um, you all were posing in the chat. If we didn't get to it, just email us at hello at redwine.blue. Hello at redwine.blue and we will get to you or reach out to one of your local organizers. You all know that we are doing this work year round for us. This is not just, you know, in the 19 days before an election. This is every day year round and we are supporting each other in a community um, so that we can keep up what is indeed a long fight, but we are going to imagine um, the ending that um, Angie has painted for us and we're going to build it together with um, the students that we heard tonight and so many others who are out there just like them. So Thank you all, Angie, thank you. And thank you to everyone who has been with us tonight. Thank you for showing up. The other side wants to divide us and exhaust us and you keep showing up instead. Like the song says, so very powerful we are. So good night, everyone. And let's hear that song again. I wanna talk about red wine and blue. R-W-E. Red wine and blue. Red wine and blue. R-W-E. Turn to red wine and blue. R-W-E. The red, wine, and blue. Red, wine, and blue. R -W -E. Look around, there's something going down, but we are, we're looking up. No matter how they try to take us down, we are, we're gonna keep it up. We move with confidence, we're making a difference, we're So powerful we are. So if you see us coming, just know we're making a change and we're not running. No, we're not going away. We stand together and we can stop the rain. Just 
change.